Hello, I'm Bob Bradley. This is THE 101, Introduction to Theater and Drama Arts. My guest today is Paula Kaplan, uh, actor, director, and playwright. She has come to this uh, career uh, after having a, uh, a well-established career previously and uh, has now uh, decided to return to an early love, uh, the theater, and we're most happy to have this conversation with her. So welcome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I should say that uh, you have a PhD uh, from Duke. Uh, <laughs> yes, okay. And not one of my favorite places. Not one of your favorite places, but that's okay. Uh, in psychology. Mm -hmm. All right. And so when you finished this PhD in psychology, what did you do with it? I did a postdoc, I moved to Toronto, uh, was uh, writing a, a book, an academic book, and then I uh, worked at the family court clinic for three years in Toronto while I was having two children, taking care of two stepchildren, uh, not having a minute, <laughs> you know, to, <laughs> certainly no time to go audition for anything and go to rehearsals, which I'd done in high school and, you know, really missed it. And, um, and then I taught at the University of Toronto for years and years. I taught, I was a professor of applied psychology and I taught in women's studies. And, and at this point, no association with theater? Or? Just went every chance yeah. I got. And an audience member. An audience okay. member. Well, actually, actually once, there, it was going to be the anniversary of the women's studies program, and somebody dug up a play about the first woman at the University of Toronto, and they wanted to do a reading of it, and they asked me to play her, and I thought, oh, it's heaven. I, I missed it <laughs> so much. So, uh, no, but during the, the rest of that time, right. uh, never. And, I, and we should certainly say that within the women's studies, you became a uh, nationally known figure uh, from your writings. And uh, in fact, my first memory of you is at some point you re returned. You were doing a lecture here at SMS on campus on... Uh, Do you remember it <laughs> specifically? Was, well, it's, it was it's, a women's issue. Yes, it was Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. And I, I wrote a bunch of nonfiction books about various issues about women and psychology and, and political stuff. And I'd written a book called The Myth of Women's Masochism. Mm -hmm. So they asked me to come and give a talk about that. They were doing a lot of stuff about, about violence against women. And actually, it was really interesting. I, I, I should just preface this by saying I, when my books came out, I did an enormous amount of media stuff in being interviewed. And I remember people would say on phone-in shows, one time there was a host on a TV phone-in show, and you know, they, somebody phones in, they ask a question, and of course the camera goes to you while they're asking the question over the phone. And I was, I was very aware that I didn't want viewers to be bored and just have me sitting there like that. <laughs> and so I, I made sure to, you know, to make it clear that I was listening and sympathizing, you know, whatever. Yeah. And after the show, the host said something about, about how, what I was doing. And he, he said, are you aware of what you do? Mm -hmm. And also, all those years when I was giving public lectures and teaching, mm -hmm. I, I was very aware that the acting I had done in high school came into it. And, you know, a lot of people would say in that context, oh, you're acting, that means you're faking. And I would always say, no, what it means is using your whole face and body and voice to convey fully what it is you're saying. And so I felt like in a way I was acting all those years. And oh, well, I've always said people ask if I act on the stage. And I said, oh, seldom, almost never, but always in the classroom. Yes. Yes. Well, right. right. It makes you, it makes yes. you less boring. That's right. Oh, yes. It, it, far better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then um, after both my kids were grown, I was divorced when they were quite young. And uh, when you're a single parent, you can't go audition and go to rehearsals all the time. And so I was still teaching. And when the second of my two children was off to college, I, uh, I had an, a, uh, an advance uh, to write another nonfiction book. And I thought, I want to go back to the States. I don't want to be in Canada anymore. And I moved to Providence, Rhode Island. I thought I'd be there for a year writing the book. Well, I moved there in August. Why did you choose Providence? Any particular Well, it was, it was a number of reasons. I love New England. My dad's from there originally. And we used to go back there every summer. And uh, also, uh, Brown University has a women's center. And they said that I could be a visiting scholar there, which means I get 
free email and library use, and that's it. <laughs> no, I don't get a desk, I don't get a mailbox. But it, it was good to have the affiliation. Mm -hmm. So in August, I got there, started writing this book, and then in the fall, the president of Brown and Vartan Gregorian had a theater weekend and was giving honorary degrees to Harold Prince and Ellen Stewart from Little Mama and so on. And Paula Vogel, who had not yet won her Pulitzer Prize mm -hmm. for playwriting, uh, gave a lecture and she said two things in there that actually moved me to tears. Uh, one was she said theater is about community. And I had just moved back from Canada. I didn't know anyone in Providence no one in Rhode Island. You know, I was really sort of starting anew. And, she, and then the other thing she said was, uh, with all the video arcades and Sesame Street and so on, uh, we need artists to slow us down. Because if we don't, we will have no collective memory. And uh, the tears were streaming down my cheeks. And I looked around, and nobody else was crying. <laughs> And I thought, OK, something's <laughs> going on that I obviously need to think about. Mm -hmm. Well, I went back. I was writing this nonfiction book. And I thought, I know. I miss theater. So I'll start with examples of, of real people who have gone through the kinds of things I'm writing about. And I did that. And I thought, there. And I thought, uh-uh. That's, that's not all I needed to do. And saw an ad for a, a free acting workshop. Never had any acting classes. Did some acting when I was at Greenwood. Um, and, and, of course, used to see everything at SMS uh, was, and loved it, was raised on Reader's Theater and Chamber Theater, which I'm amazed lots of theater people outside here don't know about and should. Yeah. Um, and, and so I just, I just decided, well, I'm going to go and take this free workshop. And then after I write the book in about six months, then I'd like to take some acting classes. Well, I went and I was so enchanted by the workshop and so happy to be back doing theater stuff that I signed up after the workshop. And it was only on the drive home that I thought, wait, you weren't going to do this for months. So I went. So the workshop was a, a come on to get you to sign up for something well, for pay? or uh, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. It was. It was. But also, I remember on the way there, I remember thinking, now, um, if they ask that, that people do improv, then I'll just slip quietly out because I love acting, but I, I would be terrified to do improv. And so I sat there, and she, the woman gave some lectures, Pat Hagnauer, or some, some lecture material. And then she got us up doing various exercises, mirroring and things. Uh, yeah. Then she said, OK, I need two volunteers. And I thought, well, probably everybody's going to have to do something. I went up, and she gave this other woman and me something to do. And I did it, and it was great fun. And the next thing you were Sat doing down, an improv. Realized that was improv. <laughs> and I thought, oh my god. So yes, so I signed up. Mm -hmm. I went to class three times, did two monologues, and was just so in love with you know, being back in theater that I went home, and I called a cousin of mine, a very distant cousin, who had run a theater school in LA for decades. Her name was Estelle Harmon. And Carol Burnett and Rock Hudson and Sharon Gless studied with her. She was very, very well respected. I had met her once. And I called her and I said, I said, I, I just want to do theater. And I said, uh, I don't know anything about taking acting classes in an acting school. I said, D is there some way you would ever consider taking a, a distant cousin? I mean, I didn't know if you just had to go and sign up or if you had to audition or what. Yeah. She said, well, why don't you send me an audition tape? And I said, oh, OK, I'll do that. Now, I had not yet taken an, aud an audition class, so I didn't know what to do. I went over to Brown, s had somebody set up this, the, the tape, and I put two long monologues, very long, the ones I'd done in class, <laughs> on the tape and sent it to her. And then she wrote back, and she said, uh, here's what she thought I did well, and here's what she thought I needed work on. And I thought, I totally agree. That's what I need work on. So I went to LA and studied full time for three months. Oh, and so then with her? With, well, with her. well, she was quite ill then, but with people right. in her school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and learned a lot of stuff. Uh, did not like LA. Um, and then I moved back to Toronto for a year and a half to, to teach again and started auditioning. 
and started being cast. And I actually got uh, my Canadian equity card. Uh, and uh, So these were professional auditions that you were going to? Yeah, well, in Toronto, there are a lot of theaters that are so, there's sort of a, a, an echelon between community theater and equity houses. Right. Well, and well, they are probably a, a non, what, what in this country we call the non-equity professional theater companies or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Fairly professional. And some of them yeah. pay you a little bit and some of them don't right. pay you anything. And uh, actually what happened, th th this is a funny story, um, there's a woman named Ginger Howard Friedman who wrote this book called Callback. And it was the sequel to Michael Shirtley's book Audition, which, which you know, theater yes. students yes. all love. And she worked with him for a long time. Well, she was teaching um, audition technique in uh, Toronto and I went to take her class. And she was giving me these monologues, and some of them were very funny. And people were laughing hysterically when I did them. And I thought, gosh, that's amazing, because in L.A., one of the things I learned was that I can't do comedy. I'm not funny. I have no timing, you know? And then I realized, now, what's the difference between the two? Ginger knows how to choose good material, and she knows how to tailor it to the person. Mm -hmm. So at the end of one of her classes, she said to me, you are auditioning, aren't you? And I said, no, and she said, well, you're ready. So that's, that's what got me started doing it. So I did that for a while, made a little bit of money. So at that point, you did, however, perhaps learn something that, in fact, many actors don't often learn, and that is choose your material wisely. Oh, it, such, it makes such yeah. a difference. Because some actors, that is that which fits you. Yes. That, that which is appropriate for you, or certainly in that which perhaps sometimes can challenge you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So um, after, after the year of teaching in Toronto again, I went back to Providence. Yeah, th this was teaching back in women's studies again? It was, it was teaching actually in psychology. psychology. Uh -huh. okay. Well, in some women's studies. Um, but it was just a year-long position. I really did want to get back to the mm -hmm. States. So I went back to Providence and thought, oh gosh, you know, I don't have an agent here. And I don't know if anything is even done around Providence or Boston. Then I found out where to get information about auditions and I went I auditioned for a, uh, it was an educational CD-ROM and I got the part and that sort of started me going so I started acting around there mm -hmm. and then the way I got into playwriting was I went back to Toronto to the Toronto Fringe Festival and I was sitting there watching this play about Zelda Fitzgerald in the sanitarium and I remember thinking this is a fascinating subject, but it's a really boring play. And then it hit me, oh, it takes place in a mental hospital. Well, my last book that I had, the one I'd written in Providence, was about the, the psychiatric establishment and some of the awful things they do. And I thought, you know, I'd love to write a play about that because I think the public needs to know, and also there's, it's a good story. And, uh, and, I, and then I remember thinking, It'll probably turn out that I can't write plays because I bet it will be different from writing these nonfiction books. I and mean, that's how naive I was. I thought, I bet it will be different. I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, but I some bet I'll... Some small difference. Uh, some small. Yeah, right. So I thought, well, I, but I bet I'll learn a lot by trying. And frankly, because my kids were both gone, I, it was the first time in decades that I got a chance to do something just for fun, you know, just because I wanted to learn. So my daughter, God bless her, for my next birthday, gave me a book on playwriting, and I read it. And then I, I wrote the first part of a play, and I showed it to her. And she was so sweet. She was trying to be supportive. And she said, well, Mom, she was about 20, she said, um, it's, it's good. And I said, well, but what? You know, what do I need to do? And she said, well, but you're, you're telling. You're telling it. And I said, yeah. And she said, well, in theater, you're supposed to show it. And I said, oh, yes, of course. Now, how do I do that? And I remember she just looked at me. She said, well, that's, that's everything you have to do. I mean, it's all about that. So see, re having taught and written nine nonfiction books where you want to be as clear as you can, make your case, logical arguments, I had to get rid of all of that. And then I remember my father who my parents always took me to every theater thing uh, that they could find. And my father said, when he read my first script, he said, well, that's interesting, it, but isn't there supposed to be some mystery in a play? And I thought, well, mystery, that's what it, I'm not sure what he means. And then 
then I came to understand. It took me a long time to understand that nobody wants to watch if they know everything that's going on. There has to be something to keep them in their seats because they want to see what's going to happen and they don't know it. Um, so that was a really important piece of, of learning. So did you take any playwriting classes? No. Have you ever taken any playwriting classes? No. Oh, okay, that's but, all right. But I've given lectures about how to write plays, <laughs> but, but only because people ask me to do it, and I always say to them, I've never taken a playwriting class, and they say, well, just talk about you know, what you know and how you write plays and, and how you make them better when, when they're not. Okay, and that's what we're doing today. Okay. So go ahead. We, so go ahead. Here I am, an <laughs> imposter yet again. Well, so, so I, I wrote this script, and I remember uh, I was aware. Now, this is the script that was, was about? About the psychiatric uh, right. establishment, and mm -hmm. it was uh, as a, actually Jane Bright, who was at Greenwood three years ahead of me, and she's now in advertising, and she said to me, oh, it's, it's about is anybody normal and who gets to decide? And I said, oh, now I see why you're in advertising. Yes, that's <laughs> perfect. Um, but it was called Call Me Crazy. And I remember writing these very serious scenes for therapists in a case conference room. And I, I did want people to learn something from it as well. And you know, some people say, well, it's not theater because there's information in there and your political perspective is clear. And at first I thought, oh God, see, I knew I couldn't write plays, I'm so ashamed. And then I started thinking, wait a minute, Brecht? You know, there are lots of, there are lots of playwrights mm -hmm. who teach you something while they entertain you and who have a very clear political perspective. And so I, I, I wrote this, this serious stuff and I knew that it was, it was too dense and too unrelievedly serious. It, it was going to have to be sort of the core, but I was going to have to do something else. So I finished this. I had lunch with Ginger Howard Friedman, and we sat there in a restaurant, and we read it aloud. And every once in a while, I said, I know it needs some I hope the, I hope the rest of the patrons enjoyed this. Oh, they have all. Oh, OK. <laughs> what you got to understand, this was Toronto. Oh, this is Toronto. Yes. Very British influence, you know. Oh, right. Let me tell you, very reserved. I'm, when you smile at somebody on the street there, they look at you like, why are you doing this to me? So it was really, it was really very strange for us to be doing this in Toronto. But she's a New Yorker, you know, oh, so it's well. fine. So, uh, and, and as we read through it, I said, I know it needs some, some sort of lightning, somehow some comedy. And then we just came up with ideas. We'd say, oh, a quiz show here. What's my diagnosis? You know, and then we, very sophomoric kinds of, of ideas that we had. One was a vaudeville scene. Um, but. I had this sense that there are a lot of people, if, if they go to a play about this subject, they would think, well, who am I to know? You know, I, I, can't, I can't judge. I don't know what to do with this information I'm hearing. I don't know how to care about the characters because what is this they're talking about? And I just had this gut feeling, if you can get people to laugh first, then they know they understand it. And then when the serious stuff happens, they're there with you. And, and that, that was what happened, actually. Um, people did get involved and sort of relaxed mm -hmm. uh, because of the comedic stuff. Have you ever, have you ever seen um, or read the play by George C. Wolfe, uh, The Colored Museum? No, which, I've heard about yeah, it. Right. When you, when you were talking, because this, of course, is to some extent almost exactly the same tactic that he uses there. Mm -hmm. Uh, although he sets it up as if you were walking through a museum and then you come to an exhibit and some of them are very serious, some of them are very funny, and of course the earlier ones are the funny one. There's a very funny takeoff on Aunt Jemima oh. uh, there and, uh, and other things. But, but this is, a, of course, the, to some extent, the, the approach that he uses in that particular play. I, sh I should read that. Yeah, go look at it sometime. There, there used to be, well, I, there is a television. There was a television showing of it. There was a tape made of it. I don't know, I don't know that I've seen it available or not, but anyway. Uh, but you might want to look at it sometime. I, I, I would love so, to. So you finished your play. Yes. And, and what did you do? Well, this is, you know, the story of how I got more and more into theater and into playwriting. Mm -hmm. It's just one chance thing after another because I had finished the play and frankly, I didn't know if it was a play because I, I didn't know, I still can't define what is a play. And also, I have learned uh, one of the advantages of starting 
playwriting when you're about 48 or 49, which is what it was five or six years ago, is that, is that you realize that when somebody says, this is what makes a play, that's their opinion. And other will, people will say, right. well, no. There's a 10-minute play I wrote, and somebody was going to do it and, and said to me, you know, I just love this play, although, of course, it's not a play, it's a scene. And I thought, oh, well, what does that mean? And then somebody else who's a real theater professional whom I respect read it, and I said, you know, this other guy says it's not a play, it's a scene. And she said, oh, for God's sake, of course it's a play. You know, so, so that it was very <laughs> good to, I think if I had been 18, I would have just sure. quit playwriting when I heard, no, that's not a real play, well, it's I a guess, scene. I guess, I guess maybe I should ask you in an Aristotelian sense, did it have a beginning, a middle, and an end? Well, yes, it did. Well, then it's a play, okay. it must be, Aristotle right. says. And, well, and, and the characters changed, you know, there was okay. an arc and all of that stuff. Um, but anyway, so I'd, I'd written this play, Call Me Crazy, didn't even know if it was a play, didn't know if it was any good, and I was in a play, I was performing in a play in Providence, and I ran into the theater office to use the phone, happened to sit at one empty desk rather than another, and while I'm making the phone call, I see this uh, notice about the Lewis National Playwriting Contest for Women. Now, you have to understand, I'm a risk taker but I always take the risks, if possible, when there's nothing at stake. It was the first thing I'd written. I didn't know if it was a play. Why did I even bother sending this off? I have no idea. But I sent it off in March. In August, I was in a play in Provincetown, and I get a phone call. You won second place in this contest. I was completely floored. And simultaneously, I had... I always have to pretend I'm my mother or my grandmother when I want to do something that takes a lot of chutzpah because I really am shy and I don't, you know, it's really hard for me to say, would you like to see a play of mine, a script, you know, I just, it's really hard for me to do it. But if I sort of get in character as my mom, you know, then, then I can do it. So I had said to this woman who had started a really good community theater in Westport, Mass, I said, do you ever do new plays? She said, why? And I said, well, I wrote this thing and and would you want to have a look at it? So then she called me, not even knowing it had won an award, and she said, we want to do your play, and, and everybody on the board wants to be in it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, so I was real, I was delighted. Everybody um, sees themselves. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Let's do this one, because there's a part for me in it. <laughs> and, uh, and it was very brave of them, because certainly nobody knew me as a playwright. Mm -hmm. and, and then she called me a week or so later and said, um, and we'd like you to direct. So there again, I said, well, I, I, don't, I don't direct. I don't know anything about directing. She said, oh, we really want you to direct. I mean, it's your play. And I said, well, a lot of people would say, for that very reason, I'm the last person who should direct. And then she told me the truth. She said, we don't have any money to hire a director. So if you don't direct it, it won't be done. I said, oh, God. I don't. She said, Paula, you've been an actor and a teacher. That makes a director. <laughs> Well, <laughs> partly true, but as you know, that's not the whole story. So I said, well, I'll do it if I can call in real directors to consult, you know, periodically and look at what's going on. Well, the people I had arranged to have come in and consult, one of them got sick, one of them was out of town, so I ended up doing it myself. And, and it, it got a wonderful review, and, and people really... really now, this it. was in... This was in Westport, Massachusetts. Westport, okay. mm -hmm. Not Westport, Connecticut, right. where... Westport, Massachusetts. Yes, yes. right. Um, and there so is a Paul difference. Newman and Joanne Woodward were not in uh. this play. <laughs> uh, but, but that went really well. And then I just started... What had happened when I wrote books um, started happening with plays that... All of a sudden, I would think, ooh, that would make a good play, or I'd like to try writing that as a play. And so I started having more and more ideas. And then the other thing that had happened, and it was, it was just by chance, was that piece of paper with the notice about the contest. Um, it was from a publication that every playwright should know about. It's called Insight for Playwrights. You can get it as email now or as hard copy. And <coughs> what somebody has done is to... Every month, um, they will send you lists of theaters that will look at new plays, contests, uh, uh, writers' retreats. And so I started subscribing to it. And when I had time, sending out my plays to just every place that looked like 
they might be interested in this sort of thing. And I got a call from this off-off-Broadway company in New York, Sage Theater, and I had sent them uh, a longish one act and, um, and Call Me Crazy. And they said, well, we love both your plays and we'd like to do them. They were doing one new play after another after another. So they produced it. Um, the woman who had been directing me in the play I was in when I saw the notice was now New York, and she directed Call Me Crazy. And it was well received. It got uh, one review, and it was wonderful in the Off Off Broadway review. And, um, and the, they did the long one act, which was about some people I knew when I was at Greenwood. <laughs> so, so Greenwood alums came and saw it, and that, that was a lot of fun. Um, and then that, you know, when, when people see your stuff and they seem to like it, then it really, it really helps you a lot in going on and writing the next thing. So I wrote, I wrote a couple more um, full-length plays, and then I wrote uh, this 10-minute play which ended up uh, being one of the winners of the Samuel French uh, Short Plays competition last summer, so it's about to be published by them. I've had a monologue published in mm -hmm. the Best Women's Monologue series. And, um, and people, have, people have really just been so responsive that it's been great. It's still terrifying, absolutely terrifying, when you go to see one of your plays being done. And, and I, I certainly don't direct all my stuff anymore. But, um, but it's, uh, except for those moments of terror, it's just been wonderful. You said that you get an idea and at that point you, you feel you, you, you want to turn this into a play. Where does the idea come? What's the source? Where, 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 where do you start? Well, every play I've written has started somewhere different. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the first one I've, I've described, the second uh, play was the one about Greenwood and what happened was I got I got angry because there's this distinguished alum award that Greenwood gives and I nominated somebody from our class Margaret Mitchell who has done more than maybe any other Greenwood graduate for other people um, she worked with people with AIDS before movie stars were saying that you should do that um, she was involved in the helping after the Rodney King riots and the fires in LA and all sorts of things. I nominated her. She's never been chosen. And I think that's because she doesn't have any money. And they, you know, they want to give an award like that to somebody yeah. who's famous or who, who was going to give them money. And so I'm, I was so upset that I wrote this play in which she wins the award. You know, I just, I felt so powerless. I thought, well, I'll make it happen on stage. And then I, and then I wrote and told the committee mm -hmm. that I said there's a play in which she wins. <laughs> and uh, I said it would, make, it would make great publicity, you know, if you made the play come true. And they, they still haven't done it. <laughs> but, uh, but and, and also, I wanted that play. It took place at a reunion. And, and I thought, well, we graduated in 1965. So we were sort of on the cusp of the women's movement. So it's about Margaret and then uh, a good friend of mine from, uh, from that class, Rosemary Rich, and then another character who's sort of based on me. And so it's also about women of that generation and how they did different things with their lives, very different things. And, and yet each of them has a moment that they talk about, a heart-pounding moment, you know, when they were terrified but they did something anyway. Um, and uh, so that's what that one's about. Now, is this the f is this a full length? It's about a forty minute play. Is this the long one act? Is that's the long one it's act. A long yeah, one act. yeah, okay. yeah. And that was that was done in New York. And then uh, the next play I wrote uh, was straight out of my own life, almost verbatim. Uh, something happened to me. I, there was somebody I'd known for seventeen years, and our relationship had gone through all these various permutations and ended in a very upsetting way. And one of the things that I was very hit hard by uh, was I realized, my God, I thought I knew this person so well. And then they did something so totally unexpected and, and terrifying. I thought, boy, you know, if I didn't know this person very well, how do you know if you really know someone ever? And I just thought that was a really interesting question. And so I wrote this play that people say is very filmic because it's, it's seven, it takes place over 17 years and I felt it was important to show how the relationship took various forms over that whole span, which meant it's, it's, it's in something like 42 scenes. 
um, with, you know, with no changes of set, just people walk from one spot to another and that sort of thing. Um, so I wrote that one and then that was done by that same company in New York. Um, and I tell you, one experience I have as a playwright, this is, it's just, <laughs> it happens all the time, is somebody will say, I hear you had a play done. I say yes, and they say, well, what's next with it? And I just have to say, there is no next. If you're a playwright, it's just like being an actor. You, you'll be lucky if any of your plays is ever done anywhere again. It's not like once it's done in Westport, Massachusetts, then everybody's dying to do it. You know? So you just have to keep sending it out and, and keep talking to people. Um, but that, that one was done by that, that same company. And then I wrote another full-length play. And my, my kids had said to me, why do you keep writing plays that require so many people? And I said, you know, you're right, and theaters are wanting to produce plays with fewer people because it's cheaper. So I sort of took that as a challenge. And I, my kids have been very supportive, but, and so they don't say these in, things in negative ways. But, they, you know, I wonder why, Mom. So I thought, okay, I'm going to write a play, and it's only going to have four people in it. And what happened was that... So did you deliberately choose the number four, or...? Yes. Well, sort of. I mean, I thought it should be... First, I thought it should be three or four. Okay. But I didn't, I didn't know what it was going to be. And but you, you set this as a kind of parameter that you right. were going to work with. Right. I, wanted, I thought, this is, this is a challenge. I bet I'll learn something from, from having that sort of structure, you know, sort of like saying I'm going to write a sonnet. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and at the same time, I had been thinking about three different stories, actually. Um, one was about, um, it was based on a 30-second story somebody told me 15 years before. And I couldn't get it out of my mind. It obviously it had all sorts of resonance for me. And I, I kept thinking, I'd love to put that on stage somehow. A second story was about my father, who, as a white Jewish captain who fought in the Battle of the Bulge, was captain of an all-black battery before they integrated the armed forces. And it was the first black battery that was sent into combat. And he had the most fascinating stories to tell. And I never wanted to hear his stories about the war because it was too painful to think of my father in a war. I didn't, uh, I only realized when I started writing about it. say this, is, this would be World War II. World War II, right, that's right. And, and, uh, and only when I started writing the play did I realize, I just, one day I just burst into tears because there's a videotape of him telling these stories and somebody else made it and I'd never really watched it all the way through. I thought, well, if I'm going to write about this, I should watch it. And he told this story about being a forward observer. Now, he tells these things in a very matter-of-fact way, um, uh, and, and he's not trying to be a hero. But he described what a forward observer does. They, in World War II, they go right up front where the shooting is, and then they report back to the heavy artillery where they need to fire. And this image of my daddy <laughs> being out there right at the front then I realized that's why I didn't want to think about that all these years. Uh, this, I don't want to think of him as being that vulnerable. It's too scary. And the third story that I had been just thinking about was um, a man named Tom, Mac Tom McDonald, whom I'd met in Springfield. He had been a career Marine, and he flew a helicopter in Vietnam and dropped Agent Orange. When he finished his career in the military, he became a massage therapist. He was the gentlest, kindest person you'd ever want to meet. Well, he knew I was an anti-war pro protester during the Vietnam War. I knew he'd been a helicopter pilot, and we just never talked about it. But he was a dear person. Well, to shorten the story, he ended up dying from Agent Orange exposure. And it was horrible. And the government denied that that was what it was until they finally admitted it. And, and I was so disturbed by that. I wanted to write about that. Well, suddenly I thought, all these people actually belong in the same play because it's a play about how good wars and bad wars affect people differently. And the fact that it's considered a good war or bad war has an impact. Um, your gender, your race has an impact on how wars affect you. So th I put these two women from the, the 15 second or 30 second story I had heard all those years before, I put them into the same play. And so it's, a, it's about these uh, people in a family, 
and then this black woman who wasn't part of the family, and it, and it all became the same, the same play. Now, I have to tell you, I wrote it about a year and a half before last September 11th. It had its first reading in Providence on September 7th, and then it had another reading on October 28th, and people were crying and saying, this is about what's happening now because it's about war, it's about what does it mean to be a good American? Can you be a good American if you don't agree with what your government is doing? Um, and, and so it's had a lot of resonance for people, even though it was about different wars. Did you, uh, did you bring all of these characters into the same time period, or did you keep them separated? Or No, I, I brought them into the same time period. So it's, it's the father, his son, who, who is the, the Vietnam War hero character, his daughter, who's the anti-war protester. So, so this is a son and a daughter who they, they adore each other. They have not only very different political views, but they um, are very different um, in terms of personalities. They, uh, Val is not me, totally, but right. she's, she's, she's pretty expressive and, and so on. And, and the, the Tom character, is very, very reserved, and, and so that made for some interesting dynamics. And of course, the father wants both of them to get along mm -hmm. and doesn't want to have any conflict. And then uh, I made the daughter a, a nurse whose husband was an, uh, a Japanese-American who was born in the internment camps, and he was in Vietnam, and he had just died. And she's come to visit her father and brother and goes as a volunteer to work with this black woman who is paralyzed from the neck down because she was in Vietnam and was hit by a grenade. And so the, what happens is the, you see the scenes between Val and June, and as their friendship develops, they're politically on the same wavelength. Now Val and June are... are the, Val is the daughter, um, and, and June is the black woman right. who was injured right. in Vietnam. Right. And so Val is there as her caretaker part of the time, but June is very, very spirited. And as their friendship develops, um, you know, they each have secrets that come out, and um, they sort of empower each other to, to talk, to open up. And then the problem is that then you see Val go back over to be with her father and her brother, and she's sort of been opened up in this way, and she, she feels sort of raw, and she's trying not to show this to her, her father and her brother, um, and then it, it finally comes out. And each of those characters, uh, somebody said, each of the people in this play uh, wants more life somehow. And each of them is isolated in some major way. And the play is about uh, how people try to break down the isolation. Some people want to break it down, others don't. They feel more comfortable. And then somebody suggested that I put another character into the play. And so it's a character who's actually based very much on my mom. Um, and, and in the play, uh, the mother has died. I apologize to my mom for that. Um, but she's watching. It's sort of, sort of like an, an Our Town um, kind of thing. So is she, she's out of body and watching? Yes, she's out okay. of body and watching. And she only speaks about four or five times in the play. And one that's is to... That's not your mother, then. That's not... <laughs> <laughs> That's not my mom. No, no, no. Um, and and uh, the first time it's to establish what kind of person she is, because in the play she's the she has more life than any of the other characters, and she has died. Um, and and she's just this this fully developed person, and she's she says what she thinks, and she's funny, and she's interested in everything. And then as she watches what happens when she learns that her son is dying of Agent Orange and she sees her son and daughter fighting and so on. You, you just see her go through this, this anguish of, of having to see this. Um, and then uh, at, the, at the very end, of course nobody sees her, nobody hears her through the whole play, but at, at the very end of the play the son has died and there, she has brought out a tablecloth. She's up in heaven, you know, and has this, she sets a table and she puts a vase and a flower and she says to the audience, I always, I always like things to look nice, don't, don't you? Uh, and, um, and then at the, at the very end, when her son has died, then uh, she takes the tablecloth and uh, she starts to put it away. And the husband, who's, who's still alive, her husband, comes over and takes the other end of the tablecloth 
and they start folding it like a flag and then he leans over and kisses her. Now the kiss was something, it wasn't my idea, but it's so beautiful. Bob Colonna, whose father was Jerry Colonna, whom people of our oh, generation yeah, remember, yes. he, he went on tour with Bob Hope, yes, and he yes. was a very comedian. funny comedian, very, yeah. Very, yes. Well, Bob Colonna is, he was, he was with Trinity Rep, which of course is one of the best yeah. regional theaters in the country, when it started. And he directed the reading of this play, and he played the father, and it was his idea to have that, that one kiss. It was, it's so beautiful, and so I left that in. So see, I don't write all of my plays myself, <laughs> as, you, as you can see, other well, people bring stuff to them. No, no playwright ever does. That's the playwright right. has to leave room for uh, the actor yes. to, to finish it. Yes. Yeah. If, you, if you wrote everything that there is, there's nothing left there. Well, that, that's right, and you know, am I talking too much? No, it's uh, right. No, 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 okay. that's what you're supposed to do. Okay, you're right. supposed to well, talk, well, so go right I want to give you a chance to, to ask things. Oh, no, 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 don't worry. They, 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 they hear lots of me, so okay. that, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I, th this is just something else that, that, uh, that I learned that I feel is really important, and that is that uh, when they asked me to direct for the first time, one of the things I was scared about was I was afraid I was going to be sort of like I'd been with my kids. You know, when you're a single mother, um, you have to make sure that everything happens just right, and you're the mother, so you're supposed to know what's right all the time. I was sure that when I started directing my play, that if an actor did something, I would say, no, 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 that's not how I pictured it when I wrote it. I thought, it's going to be awful. Well, I got there, and when we did the first read-through, in fact, in, in callbacks, people were doing very different things with what I had written, and I just kept thinking, that is so interesting. And then I loved the fact that they could take those very words and just do very different things. I, I liked learning how, how rich words could be if the right people bring their own experience and their own ideas to them. And, and in Call Me Crazy, the guy who played the head psychiatrist, he added a line one night in rehearsal. It just wasn't there. He just made it up. And I had chills up my spine. It was so brilliant. And I said, keep that. And I said, you, you, had you memorized it wrong? Or you? He said, no, it just felt like it fit there. And I said, boy, are you right. It's, it certainly does. And you wrote it down and put it in the play. I said, may I have your permission? But having been an academic all these years, it's, it's what's been really hard for me is, you know, when somebody contribute something to a paper you're writing, I make them a co-author or I, I thank them. Well, you don't do that with plays. There's no way to do, put them in the acknowledgments. Yeah. Um, and the, the, another thing I want to mention about what helped me learn about writing plays, uh, two things actually. One was that Rebecca Patterson, the, the director who did Call Me Crazy in New York, and she, she has an MFA in directing from UCLA. She's a brilliant director. Um, when she said, yes, she would direct Call Me Crazy in New York, she said, now I want you to send me a script with no stage directions in it. Well, it was the first thing I ever wrote. It had millions of stage directions in it. And I said, go. You and George Bernard Shaw. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was, it was almost a novel, you know. And, um, and, and I said, no stage directions? I was really scared. I thought, my play will fall apart without all these stage directions. And she said, well, you can use enters and exits, and that's all. So I sat down at my computer, heart pounding, and as I went through, a whole bunch of times when I took out the stage directions and then I'd look at it, I'd realize, oh, it didn't need that stage direction. It's in the words. And if it's not in the words, then either I need to change the words so it is, mm -hmm. or if it's the right, in the right place or whatever in the play, sometimes it doesn't tell everything, but I want to leave it. I want to leave um, some room for the actors to experiment and do different things with it. Um, and if it's not going to change the whole, you know, where the play goes yeah. after that into to appalling a way, mm -hmm. um, then uh, I, I have just, I just found that fascinating. One of the things it did was to give me um, sort of more confidence in my writing. I thought, ooh. I didn't know there was that much in the dialogue. And, and the second thing was that when there wasn't much in the dialogue, then I had to think about how to fix that. And, and the third thing uh, was it just, it just made me realize um, that 
that you should use stage directions very sparingly. It, it was sort of embarrassing, actually, when I when I went through and I was taking them out. I, I you know I would say I would say things like Dr. Mudge says sternly, you know, and he was mm -hmm. saying, "Now harmony, how can you do such a thing?" I went, why do you need sternly? And it was sort of demeaning to the actors right. to think that if they looked at that piece of dialogue, they weren't going to know, of course, that's sternly. Yeah. Um, so that, that was important. And the other thing that was really important to me was being put on a selection committee for a new plays festival. And I thought, well, you know, I've never done this before. And it turned out that when I, when I read plays, it turns out that I, um, I can really visualize how they're going to stage and if they'll work as, as a staged reading or as a play. And um, so I had uh, rank ordered the plays that were submitted. And the other people on the committee had seniority. And so they went along with some of my suggestions and not others. And when the festival was done, I noticed that the audience reacted to the plays in order of my rank order. The Off-Off Broadway Review came to review it, and they said exactly the same thing. And I thought, wow, that, you know, I guess, I guess I'm a good judge of this. And that was, I was glad to learn that. So then I became literary manager um, on a volunteer basis for one of the theaters in Providence and read a ton of scripts. And the thing that did, and I want anybody who's ever considering writing a play to know this, if you could read the stuff that gets submitted, <laughs> you, I don't care how bad a writer you think you are, you will see how much worse stuff yeah. there is out there. And so it made me feel, you know, usually when I would send out copies of my plays, I would feel like, I don't really have the right to mm -hmm. be doing this, to be asking somebody to take their time to read my script. And then I read this stuff that comes in and I thought, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> I am not a brilliant playwright, but, you know, it's, better than a bunch of the stuff that's out there. Now, what is the title of the last play? The last play is called Shades. Sh Shades. Yes. All right. Um, now, th now, this is the one that has the sort of four different stories. Yes. At what point did you realize that the four stories were all going to fit into this play somehow? How, how did you arrive at that? The, yeah, that, boy, yeah. that's an interesting question. Um, I, I had heard people say, well, the way I write is the characters just talk to me. And I always thought that was kind of pretentious, you know, but although it, it isn't really because that's some people's experience of it. But um, that wasn't the way I did it, you know, and so I thought, that's not what happens, but it does to some people. But what happened with me was I just, those characters started staying with me. You know, I'd be on a bus and I'd think about one of these characters and I would, I would start to understand more about who they are, not, not the plot, not at all, but about who they were, just more and more attributes of their characters and maybe information about their history. Then I started thinking about how the father and son... But, but at that. this point, they were all still they separate, separate. separate characters. Well, the, the two women were always well, in the same story. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't, know, I didn't know really almost anything about mm -hmm. the two real women that this 30-second story was about. And so I had to, I had to feel, you know, who, whom, whom did they need to be? What did they need to be like? What did they need to care about? Mm -hmm. What kind of, of dynamic was between them? How might that change as they got to know each other better? And then fairly quickly, I started to think, well, you know, maybe the World War II hero and the Vietnam hero would go in the same play. And that was sort of helped along because my mom and my dad had, had taken on this guy. They had, they had called him their surrogate son. And uh, so I think that sort of also made me think, oh, it would be interesting to have him as the real son. Mm -hmm. And um, so then I started thinking about, well, what would happen with them? Well, it would be too simplistic if they're both war heroes, you know, and they're both men. And so then I thought, well, what if the daughter, what if, what if there's a sister? What if these two women come into the same play? And that happened... You know, it was just like, oh, they're in the same play. It was, it was one of those kinds of moments. And I think it was, it was, insofar as I can put this into words, I think it was just as I felt I got to know more about these characters and uh, uh, I felt less like I was putting things there and more like, well, given that this character has this and this and this and this attributes, 
um, this is what they would do. You know, I sort of, if they had these four, then, oh, obviously they would have this fifth one, too. So the, the structure of each character sort of started to come to me. And, um, and, but then as I got to know each one of them better and sort of developed them more, um, and, I, and I had to sort of say to myself, take your time. Don't worry about the stories yet. Just take your time and just let the characters develop because you've never done this before. And, um, and I think it was, when, it was sort of like when each of them was developed enough, then I realized, ah, oh, it's as they go in the same play. At what point, or maybe, or maybe, maybe are you uh, aware of the structure of the play itself? Where, where does that enter into your <laughs> creativity? <laughs> well, it's been different for every play, and not because I decided to do that. I, I, my son's a creative writer, and, and he, he never does the same thing twice. He decides he's going to do it differently each time. Um, I don't do that. It's, um, well, the, the Call Me Crazy, I described what I did. I wrote the yeah. serious part first, right. and then I just knew nobody could sit through right. that. Um, the story about Greenwood, um, just it kind of told itself because it was just my fantasy that, oh, she wins the prize. Right. Um, and and the, the structure of Love's Hollow, which was the one about the 17-year relationship, it was there because it was, it was a real story. Um, I decided to do it in short scenes because I wanted to okay, this is the first time they meet, and then now here it's a year later, and so on. Do you find yourself writing basically in a linear fashion, or? Pretty much. Okay. Pretty much. That yes. is, one follows the other. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I have until recently, um, and actually, let me just answer your previous question, yeah. then I'll speak okay. to that. Um, and, then, and then with Shades, um, the, uh, the idea about the structure, um, when I, when I decided they should all go in the same play, then I don't know why I thought about this. I think it was because I knew some people think that plays should have a very clear structure and you should plan it out ahead of time. And I remember thinking, um, I wrote down, uh, there needs to be a scene, a couple of scenes with the two women, two or three, and it needs to go back and forth. And you need to see how what happens in the family informs what happens with Val and June and vice versa. And then there needs to be a scene, you know, between pairs of characters, different scenes between pairs of characters or the three family members. And I, and I wrote it down and it came out very neatly to nine scenes. And then I wrote those pretty much in chronological order. Um, but I, boy, I was having so much trouble. I wasn't feeling well. And I said to a friend, you know, Sometimes I just feel so tired, I can write one page a day. And she said to me, she's an actor, she said to me, but Paula, just think, if you write a page every day in two or three months, you'll be finished. <laughs> and I thought, she's right. So then I just sort of scaled back on my standard, you know, which is it's dangerous mm -hmm. to have standards mm -hmm. that you then if you don't meet them. But I scaled back and I started writing one or two, or if I did had a three-page day, I thought, wow. And then when I got to the scene that was based on the 32nd story, it just came pouring out. Mm -hmm. And the, I wrote just almost the whole scene in, in one sitting. Now, the, the way I wrote the 10-minute play, my daughter was in law school. She called me one night, and she said, I just heard a speaker. He was on death row in Georgia. And I have to tell you this story he told me. And she told me the story, and I wept. And I was haunted by the story. I tried to find the man couldn't find him. And literally, after months, since I couldn't get it out of my head, I thought, OK, you keep getting distracted by this story. Just sit down at the computer and don't get up until it's in there. Mm -hmm. And I did it, and out came this 10-minute play, almost verbatim as it still is. Um, and then that play, that's been done all over the country, um, I think, because it has to do with the death penalty wow. and wow. mental wow. retardation. Wow. Yeah. So people are interested. And it's just mm -hmm. a very touching human story. Um, now. The next play I want to write, I am writing in fragments all over the place. And it may turn out that there is no character who's in more than one scene. It's, I call it my prison play. I'm still mm. working on it. But I want, to, I want a play that has a lot of stuff happening having to do with prison from all sorts of facets and perspectives. And so I've written one scene that's very realistic. I've written another one that'll go somewhere. And it's, it's grotesque and absurdist and bizarre. 
Um, and I don't know how that one's going to turn out, but I'm writing that one totally differently than the oh, others. Good. So these days, you consider yourself primarily a playwright. Uh, I mean, that's where your focus is, um, your concentrations. Well, well, playwriting and acting. Right. I love to direct. I, yeah. I've directed a number of times, mm -hmm. but, but um, the, the thing that gives me just the most sheer joy is the playwriting and the acting. I just need time to sit well, down and write yeah, some more. Time and energies always. Yes. 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 Well, thank you very much. It has been a fascinating conversation, and uh, I think uh, certainly that many people uh, will be encouraged uh, by, by your example that uh, at whatever point in time, if you feel this is what you want to do, then just take off and go do it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.